Good morning. Welcome to all of you joining us in person and virtually. I'm Paul Brown, the Vice Chair of the Board of Regents. I'm glad to be with you today for President Mark Schlissel's presentation to the university community. My fellow Regents and I are pleased that you have joined us to hear our President's reflections on the current state of the university and its priorities and initiatives for the coming years. But before we get to that, I'm technically a politician and I have not been in front of a crowd for two years, so I have a lot of, <laughs> I have a lot of making up to do, so, so get comfortable. <laughs> I'd first like to tell you a funny story that happened to me this morning, which would tell us what we've all been going through in the last two years. I walked out downstairs, greeted my two kids in a suit for the first time in a long time, and they both looked at me and said, Dad, why do you have a suit on this morning? And I said, well, I'm going to make a speech at the B school. And my 10-year-old son, and I'm not sure he was joking, said, there's a school for bees? <laughs> know, that's a B school joke. Those MBAs can tell that. Uh, and my 12-year-old daughter said, B school? Dad, University of Michigan is an A school. <laughs> well, thought those were cute and thought everyone would enjoy them. But since joining the university, we've been hit with a global pandemic. We emptied our classrooms, our dorms, our stadiums and arenas, and our hospitals and then we filled our hospitals with critically ill COVID patients. Now, I know many others have had to endure much, much worse, but I'm telling you all of these things that have happened pretty much since I joined the board are an example of correlation, not causation. Or at least that's what I tell myself. Um, but in all seriousness, the last two years, the university has been faced with several crises, not of our creation, each unprecedented, unpredictable, and representing an existential threat to the university. But these crises came as a single conflagration. Our options as leaders of this institution were often choosing between lousy and horrible. Our own constituencies often were exactly split on which of these unsatisfactory options we should choose. Um, it's enough to keep a new region up at night. Uh, and I did have many sleepless nights but there was one reason I was ever able to get any sleep, and that was because of all of you leaders at the university, and especially President Mark Slissel. As I told the Daily, it's not enough to be at the right place at the right time. You have to be the right person at the right place at the right time. And all of you were that person, and Mark was that president. As the world-leading immunologist, I did not rest easy, but I could rest knowing that Mark had all the knowledge and skill one could wish for to make these impossible decisions that ultimately kept us as safe as we could be in a global pandemic and the university as healthy as it could be in a global economic shutdown. If I hadn't said it enough, I just want to thank all of you for the incredible hard work you did, and especially to President Mark Schlissel. Well, now I better get to the part that they told me I had to say. The Regents commend President Mark Schlissel for his leadership during an extraordinary time in the world and the life of this university. He has navigated a global pandemic, marshalling the knowledge and expertise in our university community uh, so we could remain, so we could stay with our academic uh, and research excellence. For the second year in a row, the University of Michigan has been named the number one public university in the nation. Beginning this fall, a Michigan education will be available to even more students. The Regents are pleased to support the President's expansion of the Go Blue Guarantee uh, and expanding that to eligibility to Flint and Dearborn campuses. This program, as you know, provides four years of free tuition to high achieving in-state students whose family's income is $65,000 or less. Now qualifying students on all three campuses will be able to benefit from this program the President's Commission on Carbon Neutrality presented its report to the Regents in May. The goal of achieving carbon neutrality spans the entire university, including 40 million square feet in buildings, three campuses, our athletic complex, and the Michigan medicine system. The ambitious undertaking to address the climate crisis is absolutely fitting for a great public university. This morning, we will have an opportunity to hear President Schlissel discuss the initiatives, priorities, and plans for the future and the topics that are in his sights. 
I hope you will take advantage of the opportunity to ask questions at the conclusion of his remarks. It is with great pleasure that I introduce my friend, Mark Slissel, 14th president of the University of Michigan. Thanks, Paul. That was really fun. Thank you very much. So uh, thanks, Regent Brown, uh, for the very kind uh, introduction and the uh, children jokes. Uh, and good morning, colleagues, uh, students, friends, here in the Roth School and, and those watching on the live stream. Uh, it's really a pleasure to welcome you to this year's leadership address, my seventh since beginning as president. Can you believe it's been seven plus years? I'm looking at Erica, and she's nodding. Uh, this is the eighth year of my presidency and an important time to think about the future we'll share. It's impossible to have the view that I do and see the lives we save, the students we educate, the knowledge we create, and the frontiers we challenge without also considering how to best position this wonderful university for perpetual excellence. During this pandemic, we've endured more than our fair share of changes that happen overnight. And we've heard the words uncertain and unprecedented so frequently that very quickly they were deemed overused. I announced my decision Tuesday to step down as president at the end of 2023 in an effort to avoid uncertainty and to be in keeping with the precedent that the best transitions occur at the right time and are thoughtful and deliberate. I've discussed this with our regents and feel that an announcement a couple of years out allows for a smooth transition, which I'll support in every way that I can, while ensuring that we can continue the important work we're doing. What is certain is U of M's deep commitment to improving our community and world, along with the abundance of resolve that's always been a defining quality of our university. We drive the cadence of human progress. There's no truth we fail to pursue, no problem we back away from, and no line of inquiry we will not cross. I'm exceedingly proud of what we've accomplished thus far together and remain excited about what we're planning for the years ahead. I was reminded of that promising future last week. On Friday, Regent Acker and I joined Dean Curzan for the ceremonial opening of the LSA building renovation and addition. As a gorgeous state-of-the-art home for the liberal arts, it's an outstanding milestone for the University of Michigan. It's a place of learning, support, and ideas, like the Opportunity Hub and the Optimize program, where academic advising is coordinated with internships and career services, where students can network, collaborate, innovate, have social impact, and imagine the road ahead. It's also a monument to where we're going as a university. We're a university whose work matters. Like the new space in LSA, U of M is uniting our formidable disciplinary strength, better serving our students, and engaging with community and business partners, alumni and donors, to address major societal challenges. As I've said before, initiatives and projects that bring us together make us better. Today I'm going to share some updates and announcements that focus on making us an increasingly relevant and innovative university an institution that draws excellence from the full breadth of our community, keeps its doors wide open to provide opportunity to talented people from all parts of our state and beyond, adapts to the needs and changes in society, leads the world to greater levels of understanding, and directs our intellectual might to the service of our public mission. This fall, we felt this much more poignantly. You are helping us overcome a global pandemic, and we've regained those parts of our mission that have made us excellent for more than two centuries. Our students are taking classes in person, delivered in modalities based on world-class pedagogy. Our research enterprise, which I'll discuss in more detail, is back in full stride. Our students, faculty, and staff have blended traditional and remote methods of service to make greater differences in communities. And the full residential experience has returned in all of its co-curricular glory. 
As Ronnie Kane wrote in the Michigan Daily Story on the Glass Animals concert, Thursday night made it official. The Wolverines are back on campus. Thanks to extremely high levels of vaccination and additional public health measures, we've transitioned from daily worries about heat maps to cheering on heat waves at the Chrysler Center. Our health and safety efforts are ongoing, but we crossed a significant threshold 39 days ago when we opened Michigan Stadium for an in-person student convocation. It was a very special afternoon for all of us, and I want to share a brief video that captured some of the excitement and meaning we felt being together once again in the big house. Michigan students are known to be smart, talented, and willing to work hard. And over the past 18 months, you have also shown perseverance and resilience, exemplifying what it means to be leaders and best. We expect you to take in everything this university and city has to offer you. And I'm talking about everything from knowledge to friendships to skills here, Wolverines. But we also expect that you'll give back enrich our campus, enrich our university, your university. We can be the kinds of leaders that the world needs now and in the future. The kind of leaders that Michigan strives to produce. And most importantly, the kind of leaders that you all have the potential to be. I'd like to end with one bit of advice that also has to do with being back together. Be open to considering different ideas. Don't be afraid to share your own beliefs, but resist the temptation to ostracize others for theirs. I welcome you to the Michigan family. Please always remember that we are all better because each and every one of you are here. I hope to see you all on campus. Have a great year. Stay safe, have fun, and go blue. The first year students who joined us for convocation were from amongst the largest applicant pool in U of M history and members of our most competitive undergraduate class ever. Our classrooms, residence halls, performance venues, and athletic facilities are full of activity because of the thousands of you who made this type of semester possible. The healthcare professionals on the front lines, the instructors who adapted their courses, the dining and custodial professionals who are front and center, and the staff working behind the scenes. The students who persevered, helped others, and inspired us. The donors whose generosity helped us address critical issues, and our community and government partners who collaborated with us to make our region, state, and world better. Even without our traditional breakfast this morning, time constraints don't permit me to list everyone who's been pivotal to our efforts but I do want to mention just a few. I established the Campus Health Response Committee in July of 2020 to support the health of the university during the pandemic. They meet multiple times a week and are experts in their domains. As many of you know, there's a complex and constantly changing mix of federal, state, and local public health guidelines that influence what we do on our campuses. The CHRC members stay abreast of these guidelines along with the most up-to-date research. Some of them are here this morning, and I invite them to stand and be recognized. A much larger group of five dozen or so, called the Emergency Operations Center COVID-19 Planning Team, include staff representing multiple units from all three campuses and Michigan Medicine. At the outset of the pandemic, they met daily. That means seven times a week. 
They instituted a tool for quickly sharing information and uh, their expertise helped the leadership team and me be more responsive to the needs at a university that is large and decentralized. Thank you, EOC members. SACUA has also selected new members for the second faculty COVID-19 council to share ideas and concerns. Uh, Provost Collins and I are meeting with them regularly. I think our next meeting is tomorrow morning. Uh, the university-wide commitment to moving us forward amidst a very challenging pandemic will forever be one of my most meaningful memories. Thank you all for your help with this. One of the traditions of this event is honoring those faculty who are elected to national academies. This year, we're celebrating two cohorts worth of top faculty as we didn't meet last year. In addition to the National Academies, we count 10 new Thurnau professors, six Sloan Research Fellows, five Guggenheim Fellows, two Carnegie Fellows, and one MacArthur Fellow. You can see the full list on the screen, and some of these colleagues are here with us today. In the past year and a half, We've been pleased to welcome three interim deans across the university and several new deans. At U of M Flint, Cynthia McCurran heads the School of Nursing. Beth Kubitsky leads the School of Education and Human Services. And Christopher Pearson leads the new uh, College of Innovation and Technology. At U of M Dearborn, Gassan Gridley leads the College of Engineering and Computer Science. And Ann Lampkin Williams leads the College of Education, Health, and Human Services. Flint's provost, Sonia Feast Price began last year, and Dearborn's interim provost is Gabriella Scarlatta. Among executive officers, Chris Cole began as our vice president for government relations in January, and Jeffrey Chattis began as our executive vice president and chief financial officer just last week. Also attending his first leadership address is vice president for student life, Martino Harmon, who joined us in July of 2020. So welcome new colleagues. I'm also pleased to announce two more additions to my own inner circle. New for me, since the last time we had this event, are two new grandkids. Uh, some of you may have met them over Zoom. That's Avery on the left and Caroline on the right. They're eager to come and visit here in Michigan as well. Uh, Monica and I, as you can imagine, are just delighted. Uh, thank you again for uh, allowing this uh, grandpa a moment of personal pride. Uh, the realities of the pandemic last year meant that we were not able to say farewell to one of our long-term colleagues in person. When Cynthia Wilbanks was nominated as the Vice President for Government Relations in 1998, President Bollinger cited her leadership and wisdom and noted that she was an astute student of politics. At the end of last year, she retired from U of M after an extraordinary career. I know I'm not alone in saying I relied on her wisdom, leadership, and political acumen over the years. During her quarter century with us, she helped to redefine the role of the public university in society. It's always been her belief that U of M must be an immutable part of the local, state, and national landscape, and that we must help to develop the policies, economic opportunities that benefit our communities. The partnership she built led to unparalleled opportunities for our students and researchers that are in force still today. At U of M, she worked with four governors, 10 speakers of the State House, six US secretaries of education, three Ann Arbor mayors, and dozens and dozens of legislators. She maintained and strengthened these relationships through incredibly hard work and is a repository of knowledge of state politics. One of my favorite stories is that once she took a pen out of her handbag during a meeting to hand draw the map of a congressional district to emphasize her point. <laughs> That's a nerd. Uh, she also recognized that faculty expertise can elevate national discourse and be a powerful tool in advocacy, not just for universities, but for the issues that matter most to our citizens. Cynthia was kind enough to join us this morning. Thank you, Cynthia. One area of our pandemic response that we can all take tremendous pride in is our research enterprise. As it has for more than 200 years, 
Michigan research triumphed. In key measures, we're exceeding pre-pandemic levels of productivity. Year to date, total research activity is 3.4% higher than 2019's pre-pandemic levels. Federal research activity is up 17% from 2019. And new proposal submissions are now higher than pre-pandemic levels. As part of our commitment to translating research to the marketplace, we're reporting 23 startups and 502 inventions during fiscal year 2021, a level comparable to our very best years. U of M is ranked number two in the country for startup company formation behind only MIT. Our successes include Blue Conduit, a startup from Ross that uses machine learning to help towns identify and replace lead-contaminated water lines. And earlier this year, the startup EVOQ Therapeutics announced a $240 million collaboration with Amgen for the development of novel drugs for autoimmune disorders. U of M Dearborn reports that researchers have been awarded more than $4 million in outside funding for the first two months of this new fiscal year, which is more than half of last year's annual total. The boost has come from federal sources, primarily the National Science Foundation, which is a change for a campus whose largest funder normally has been industry. Well done. Let's give applause to our research community. <laughs> Last month, we celebrated the dedication of the Ford Motor Company Robotics Building, which extends what we consider a model industry alliance in higher education. It advances U of M research opportunities, for, uh, provides exceptional opportunities for students, and is the first university private sector collaborative building in our 200 year history. In addition to our existing research efforts across the university, we're working to align information about future government programming, philanthropic interest, and uh, faculty expertise to stimulate new important collaborative work on federal research priorities. We'll hear more about this from Vice President Cunningham in the coming weeks. Our Biosciences Initiative enters its fifth year with a new coordinating committee comprised of stellar U of M faculty. Its successes thus far include creating nine major scientific research initiatives in areas such as RNA biology, climate change biology, and infectious disease threats. We've also created or improved eight research cores and started five new competitive funding programs. The initiative has enhanced synergy across the life sciences and related disciplines with involvement from 14 of our schools and colleges. Hiring for the 30 new faculty positions we allocated will continue in the months ahead and funds that have been allocated will be put to work. Our Institute for Firearm Injury Prevention we launched two years ago is off to a successful start as well. Last month, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention awarded a $6 million grant to support the Michigan Youth Violence Prevention Center. Based at U of M, the center is one of only five national centers of excellence in youth violence prevention. The grant will support researchers partnering with communities on innovative projects that seek to reduce youth firearm violence. It also adds to our leadership as U of M researchers have secured more federal funding to study firearm injury prevention than any other academic institution in our nation. In 2016, at this event, we announced the creation of the Poverty Solutions Initiative based on recommendations made by, a facu by faculty in a report earlier that year. I remember their ideas and conclusions very well. They found that while research on poverty was being conducted in many of our departments, the scholars were often working wholly independently and unaware of each other. And not all of our work was having the impact that it deserved. Five years later, that's changed. Recent Census Bureau research has shown a 30% decline in food insufficiency for adults with children and a 43% decline in food insufficiency for low-income households. These hopeful declines in hardship are the result of the payments that went out this year under the expanded child tax credit. An expansion the New York Times and Time Magazine reported was motivated in part by the work of Professor Luke Schaefer and Poverty Solutions. Dr. Schaefer and his colleagues advocated for the expanded credit, 
providing analysis that demonstrated its benefits in July of 2020 when he testified before Congress. The CTC expansion was signed into law by President Biden on March 11, 2021, as part of the American Rescue Plan. After it passed, Poverty Solutions joined Mayor Duggan and a broad Southeast Michigan coalition to connect families to the CTC and created a website with step-by-step -step guidance for parents to ensure they receive it. The White House called it one of the strongest efforts in the nation at outreach. And Dr. Schaefer was back in the House of Representatives last month to testify on the benefits of making the CTC permanent. A policy brief by Poverty Solutions faculty members uh, Natasha Pakauskas and Patrick Cooney provides even more promising data. They note that collaborators at Columbia University estimate that the expanded CTC has already reduced child poverty by nearly 30%. That's 3.5 million children lifted out of poverty. And this number is expected to grow even higher as more families receive payments. Thanks to many faculty, students, and staff, an impressive array of, and an impressive array of partners, we're realizing this initiative's vision to inform, seek out, and test new strategies for preventing and alleviating poverty. And we're seeing the benefits during a time when our work was so desperately needed. Poverty solutions impact does not end there. A bipartisan group of U.S. Senators cited a report by U of M's Jen Erb Downward as motivation for an additional $800 million to help homeless public school students during the pandemic. And the initiative helped shape a $50 million eviction prevention fund here in Michigan that U of M researchers found cut the number of evictions to a tiny fraction of what they were the previous year. We're a university who works, whose work matters. As leaders, we're all aware of trends that are shaping the future of higher education. There are fewer graduates from our high schools. Public funding is viewed as a political fight rather than an investment. And many communities have less access and opportunity throughout their educational journeys. We're strategically tacking through headwinds and as we, have, uh, as we have throughout our history. Michigan is leading the field. Helping us navigate this journey is our Center for Academic Innovation. In discussing their book titled, Learning Innovation and the Future of Higher Education, Josh Kim of Dartmouth and Eddie Maloney of Georgetown point to what's going on at Michigan as an example of a larger trend. One of colleges and universities creating new organizational structures and committing significant resources to drive the advancement of student learning. The Center for Academic Innovation is regarded as a leader in higher education. Since its launch in 2019, we doubled our MOOC enrollments to 16 million, with unique learners accounting for half of that growth. They come from all around the globe, and there are more learners in India than there are in the United States. We're transforming residential education as well. 96% of U of M undergraduates and more than 100 other institutions are using educational software developed by the center. The center has partnered with 11 of our schools and colleges for immersive learning projects under their XR initiative. Higher education is trending towards a blended future where the boundaries between residential and online education are blurred. This is happening at the same time that many careers will require upskilling again and again over the course of decades. And workers all over the globe will be competing in the same job market. We're envisioning opportunities in lifelong education that are interdisciplinary, interprofessional, and intergenerational, with more pathways for diverse learners in a more inclusive environment. And these opportunities will be bolstered by key U of M strengths in curricular innovation, data and research, and educational technology as we move towards a global virtual campus that will stand alongside the world-class residential experience we will always offer on our campus. U of M has never shied away from the biggest challenges. No matter the complexity, we confront them head on, especially when solutions are not yet clear. This summer's United Nations Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change report concluded that some climate change effects accelerated by human activity 
are already irreversible for centuries and millennia to come. In March, we announced new strategies pertaining to our endowment and its natural resources investments. We committed to achieve a net zero endowment by 2050, the first such pledge from an American public university. In May, we committed to achieve carbon neutrality at the University of Michigan based on the detailed recommendation of the Presidential Commission on Carbon Neutrality. We're working to eliminate greenhouse gas emissions from direct on-campus sources, reduce emissions from purchased electricity to net zero, and establish innovative goals for emissions from indirect sources, like commuting, university travel, and food procurement. Progress is well underway. We look forward to installing U of M's first geothermal heating and cooling systems for the Beister Building. We're preparing to formally present this project to the Board of Regents for their approval and we as we consider future geothermal energy projects. Approximately half of the purchased electricity for the Ann Arbor campus now comes from Michigan-sourced renewable wind energy. This reduces U of M greenhouse gas emissions by more than 100,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide annually, equivalent to the annual emissions generated by 12,000 homes. And in the first step towards decarbonizing our vehicle fleet, we've purchased four all-electric buses for deployment next year on the Ann Arbor campus, with many more to come. Groups are working towards purchasing more electricity from renewable sources, implementing sustainable building standards, instilling a culture of sustainability, and pursuing other key actions. Likewise, various units and colleges are taking their own actions. LSNA established a task force to identify immediate and long-term goals that can propel it to carbon neutrality. U of M Flint established its own sustainability committee addressing important topics like fleet electrification and energy use tracking. The campus is also collaborating with the city of Flint on the city's development of an environmental sustainability plan. Additionally, we're expanding the Planet Blue Ambassador Program to Flint and Dearborn to empower community members to live, work, and learn sustainably. Ultimately, our most important contribution will come from our strength as a research university. That's why we're making significant investments in carbon neutrality research and development, building on multidisciplinary initiatives like the Carbon Neutrality Acceleration Program, the Global CO2 Initiative, and the Institute for Global Change Biology. In its first round of funding, the Acceleration Program awarded $1.75 million to seven projects, each with dramatic potential to help reduce net carbon emissions. We all have a role to play in making U of M the most sustainable university it can be. Critical to all of this will be a new campus executive leader tasked with managing and coordinating carbon neutrality related efforts university wide. We're preparing a national search that we'll conduct in the months ahead. In all of our carbon neutrality efforts, we'll listen and learn from key communities to ensure that what we put into practice is not only environmentally sustainable, but socially just. Climate change and other environmental challenges affect us all, but do not affect us all equally. Frontline and fenceline communities are bearing the burden of the climate crisis. This morning, I'm pleased to announce an important step we're taking to advance this value. The Northlight Foundation and Dan and Cheryl Tishman have committed an $11.125 million gift to establish the Tishman Center for Social Justice and the Environment at the School for Environment and Sustainability. The gift also creates the Tishman Scholarship Fund and two Tishman professorships in environmental justice at SEAS and in the College of Engineering. These initiatives will build on U of M's legacy in the environmental justice field. We were the first university to define environmental justice as an academic field nearly 30 years ago, elevating the idea that all of us, and especially those most vulnerable, have the right to protection from environmental risks and representation in decision making. The Tishman Center will enable the university community to better integrate environmental justice into all solutions for the planet. The last time we gathered for this address in 2019, I announced the startup phase of a comprehensive arts initiative 
to unleash imagination and creativity at the University of Michigan. In the two years since, the challenges we faced have acutely demonstrated why the arts are indispensable to a healthy functioning society. To illustrate this point, I'm going to talk about a passion of mine, immunology. Uh, I promise this will be brief, and Jonathan and Tina begged me not to share all the slides I have of capsid proteins, but a while ago, there was a 13-year-old boy who lived in France. The CUNY historian, Bert Hansen, writes that this boy exhibited a precocious talent and studied for six years, talent for drawing, and studied for six years under two art teachers. He would remain actively engaged in the fine arts throughout his life, but he was never well known for those pursuits. Instead, his legacy is based on what he would later study, disciplines in which he would achieve greatness, chemistry, physics, microbiology, and immunology. Where would we be in this pandemic, and how many more lives would be lost without the contributions and pioneering vaccine research of Louis Pasteur? That teenager who studied drawing and whose later pastels were lauded by Parisian artists. Hansen asserts that the habits Pasteur developed as an artist helped him to see things without distraction and conceptualizing things in three dimensions. A fundamental notion behind our initiative is the idea that the arts are as essential to a university as they are to life itself, making us excellent, complete, and comprehensive teaching us new ways to visualize, imagine, and understand, and taking us far beyond their instrumental value to a place where we can, as this university has always aspired to do, answer the most profound questions of life. During the startup phase, the Arts Initiative has helped us find ways to heal from the pandemic. In partnership with the University Musical Society, Yo-Yo Ma spent a six-month residency alongside our students and local artists to develop a travel guide for talking hearts. One aspect of this guide called on participants to reflect through writing, drawing, and conversation on questions such as, what must we remember about this past year, and what must we forget? Our arts initiative has also launched several pilot projects, including Envisioning Real Utopias, a collaboration across the social sciences and architecture. The project demonstrates the promise of a new form of creative collaboration to address urgent problems. By borrowing from arts practice, this pilot will envision alternative housing arrangements and wealth distribution to provide a blueprint for how we can build a more equitable society. Another arts initiative project united a team of data scientists, artists and designers, curators and digital collection experts. They applied facial recognition algorithms to examine UMA's entire collection, assess how it represents humanity, and examine how data science and the arts can amplify one another to advance social justice. The Arts Initiative has a new managing director, Christopher Audain, and it's moving into an accelerating phase in its work to more deeply weave the fabric of the arts into our entire university mission, experience, and identity. There are several more impactful projects underway for the year ahead. For instance, the initiative is establishing a culture core of community college and U of M undergraduate students who will receive paid internships, paid immersive internships in Southeast Michigan arts and culture organizations. Its goals are threefold, to help encourage a sustained pipeline of diverse students into arts and culture careers, to encourage and expose students to humanities majors and careers generally, and to support a breadth of art and culture organizations with a consistent group of paid students. Additionally, the UMS presentation of Fiddler on the Roof will provide a unique opportunity to explore the impact of how our communities and traditions are impacted by surrounding socio-political upheavals. This is a new model partnership that brings together performative and scholarly elements. Collaborators include SMTD, LSNA, the Grand Rapids Symphony, and the Philadelphia Orchestra. We'll examine Fiddler through a broader lens, embracing a diverse cast of individuals affected by oppression and displacement, and telling a vital Jewish narrative in a contemporary global context. As we all look ahead to what the future holds for our campus, the Arts Initiative will be a vital force for advancing new ways to solve problems, heal, connect, 
learn, and grow. Over the past several months, the University of Michigan has responded to the inequities and injustices in our society with an impressive breadth of actions of advocacy. U of M research has helped us understand the disproportionate harms of COVID-19, the rise of xenophobia, the impact of police violence on mental health, for example. We've provided support and healing when we felt the painful effects of white supremacy, racism, xenophobia, bigotry, and hate. Members of our community have directed their service and scholarship to advance equality and justice through university efforts that include academic innovation, faculty public engagement, and the George Floyd Memorial Scholarship. The pandemic has had disparate impact on members in our community who have disabilities. So we will continue to rethink and promote equitable access and opportunities for all, as we are with the Toward an Anti-Ableist Academy conference that's taking place throughout October. One of the goals of our strategic plan for diversity, equity, and inclusion was to ensure that our highest values are built into our decision making and the work that we do in units all across the campus. The leaders here with us today and many, many more in the community have helped us achieve this goal. DEI is forged into our teaching and learning, research, patient care, budgeting, hiring, student recruitment, and campus events. We're also more explicitly engaged in larger dialogue about inclusivity and racism, questioning not only policies and actions, but also the structural foundations of many institutions in society, including our own. Though we've made tremendous progress with our initial five-year DEI strategic plan, there is still much work to be done, and this requires constant vigilance and a commitment to continuous improvement. At next week's summit, we'll have more to share on DEI 2.0, including the planning underway to shape the next initiative. This will include a census survey open to all students, faculty, and staff on campus beginning in late October, as well as scientific sampling of the opinions of our community. I hope that you'll join me in participating in the month of activities associated with the summit. We'll be continuing our work to advance DE&I, of course, over the next year. The Provost Office's anti-racism initiatives are moving forward. This includes the faculty hiring initiative and implementation of many recommendations from the Advancing Public Safety Task Force. The Office of the Vice President for Research, in partnership with the National Center for Institutional Diversity, recently awarded nearly $500,000 in anti-racism grants to eight research teams from across the Ann Arbor campus. They'll explore both the systemic and interpersonal racial inequalities to ultimately inform actions to achieve equity and justice. To make our university a better place today, we must examine the racism and lack of inclusion that has been part of our past, part of our own history, and that of our nation. This includes actions that were taken and structures that caused harm to groups in our own community. And questioning common sense that actually represents systemic inequity. Many of these factors continue to influence U of M generations later, and a fuller reckoning will help to make us a more equitable and inclusive campus and steer our direction in the future. I've been having conversations with many on campus about what this examination should look like, and we'll have more to announce on this in the months to come. We'll also continue our pressing work to transform how the university prioritizes the principles of care, support, and education in the prevention and adjudication of sexual misconduct, including the cultural journey group led by Sonia Jacobs and Dean Patricia Hearn. In the ceremonial sense, my Michigan journey began seven years and one month ago uh, as my inauguration kicked off in this very room. Back then it was called the Blau Auditorium. We hadn't yet opened up the Jeff T. Blau Hall next door. That day we held symposia on the future of the biomedical research enterprise and privacy and identity in a hyper-connected world. These symposia address problems that were both generations in the making and changing by the day. Problems that demanded the attention not just of physicians and computer scientists, but also historians and engineers and attorneys and biostatisticians and neuroscientists and behavioral scientists. 
And that day, they were all up here on this stage, demonstrating the breadth of excellence and depth of thought that few places have. Of course, we have that here at the University of Michigan. The initiatives and issues I've discussed today are made possible by the breadth and depth of academic excellence at U of M combined with our public ethos. Your commitment to challenging the present, enriching our future, and making our world better. We're a university whose work matters. And in the years to come, I pledge to you that our important work will continue together with my full support, deepest gratitude, and eternal admiration. Because as long as challenges remain in our society, the University of Michigan's work will remain unfinished. Thank you for your commitment to our great university. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd be happy to take a number of questions for a little while. I know this was a long speech, but I had two years worth of stuff pent up inside of me. And there'll be microphones um, making their way around the auditorium. Yeah, I have a question. So thank, thank you for your remarks. Thanks for laying out your vision and also progress um, over the last few years. Um, in your remarks, you described that higher ed is moving towards a blended future. Um, what, what excites you about this, and how might these combined commitments to carbon neutrality, uh, DEI, innovation, how might they put us in a position to lead? Yeah, th thanks, James. So, you know, the question is, how, how does our work uh, on a blended education actually uh, interact with our uh, work on uh, diversity uh, and um, uh, public engagement? I think they all come together incredibly well. Um, what uh, our work on academic innovation allows us to do is reach learners not just here on campus, but where they are, you know, where they are around the world or where they are in our communities. Um, of course, uh, as we're trying to uh, diminish travel, uh, having a guest lecturer fly in from California is a pretty carbon intensive hour long experience in the classroom. Uh, but getting a guest lecturer to pop on a, a Zoom uh, using uh, online modalities uh, allows our students to be exposed to more and different interesting uh, thoughts and ideas uh, while still living up to our ideals around preserving the planet. Um, the beauty of the internet is ultimately it'll be able to reach into every nook and cranny on Earth. Uh, so literally anybody that can get internet access can get educated and be educated by the University of Michigan. Uh, although I think our forte will remain place-based education, uh, the reach of that education can be dramatically extended and the duration of time that a, a student feels like they're a Michigan student won't end with graduation in the big house. It'll exist throughout their career as they continue to look back to the University of Michigan for their ongoing education. Uh, another thing that uh, we've been empowered to do uh, through our academic innovation initiative is to speak out on issues of public concern. You know, we're, we're teachers and we're educators. Uh, unfortunately, many debates in society in recent years have not been driven by fact, uh, but that's what we do, right? We collate facts, we help people understand them so that our fellow citizens and our policymakers can best do their jobs. Uh, so by using the capacities of our academic innovation group, public engagement is strengthened because we can reach uh, more uh, decision makers and more of our, our fellow citizens with information that's been you know, thoughtful, factual, well curated. So there are lots and lots of synergies, James. And you know, it's one of the things I'm proudest of at the university is how we're leading, you know, not just in providing online modalities of education, but providing new ways to teach uh, by applying data science to teaching and learning, uh, by developing new technologies. It's the full package and I'm very proud of it. Other, other questions or commentary? It's hard to recognize who people, oh, Christina. Good morning, President Schlissel. Um, you talked a lot about the uh, role of the university in uh, seeking solutions to challenges facing the nation. I'm wondering, you've also talked a lot about the role of our faculty in their use of using their expertise to benefit the nation. Do you think that that was particularly true during times 
like the ones that were coming out of like Just during the pandemic. Tell me the last part of your question one more time and hold the mic against your mask. Do you think that um, you've talked a lot about the role of faculty using their expertise to benefit the nation. I'm wondering that during times like the ones we're coming out of now, uh, like a pandemic, do you think that that role is especially true during these times? Oh my goodness, yes, thanks. So the, you know, the role of faculty expertise, not just teaching our students and doing research, but contributing to real-time problem solving in a complicated world. And you know, we're living through the best example of this you know, in my lifetime, how the biomedical research community and the public health community have been front and center in the response to the pandemic. Uh, imagine where we'd be without the basic discovery research and then the development of RNA-based vaccines. Um, you know, we, we wouldn't be here today, we'd still be online. Um, our public health colleagues, uh, despite you know, being uh, dramatically overworked, uh, I've never seen them as excited to make contributions uh, to a real-time problem affecting everybody's life as I've seen during the course of the pandemic. Uh, although uh, they don't step forward and claim credit, they're the folks whispering in the ear ears of our state level politicians as they try to make good decisions steering the, the state of Michigan and also the nation through the pandemic. So it's a, a spectacular example. I also spoke today about poverty solutions. You know, eventually the public and politicians do listen to data driven arguments that speak to really important issues. Sometimes it takes way too long. But I remain confident at the end of the day, the expertise represented by the Michigan faculty and, and by our students will carry the day in important ways. Uh, President Schlissel, at the outset, uh, thank you for your inspiring leadership uh, last seven years, but especially incredible leadership during this past year of the pandemic. Thank you, we are grateful. Uh, while I have absolutely enjoyed uh, working with Provost Collins, I would love to hear uh, a, an update on the search for the, uh, pro, pro, update on the status of the Provost search. Uh, Provost search, thank you, uh, Ravi. Uh, so, you know, first, I should have really thanked at least one person individually, which was Susan Collins, for stepping up under extremely challenging circumstances a couple of years ago. And basically with just like three days notice or something, you know, dropping what she was doing after having spent a successful decade as Dean of the Ford School and now back doing her own scholarship and, and public engagement work, uh, dropped everything to really first serve as acting provost and interim provost, and then uh, provost uh, for a, a two year term. And you know, Susan did this out of a love for the institution and a commitment to really all of us as a community uh, but she made clear from the very beginning that she'd you know, take a two-year appointment on top of her interim service, but, but that was it. Uh, so what we're in the process of doing now is developing uh, the method we're going to use that leads to the appointment of our next provost. And I'll have much more to say about that in the coming uh, couple of weeks. Uh, but uh, I think Susan actually deserves a great round of applause for her service. Other questions or topics? Yeah, hi. Hi, I was just hoping you could say a little bit more about the uh, challenges and plans for Flint and Dearborn campuses as well. Yep, so you know, the, the regional campuses of the university uh, extend our reach into communities that are not particularly well represented here in Ann Arbor. The Ann Arbor campus is national and global and Flint and Dearborn are very regionally focused. Um, they provide access to many first-generation students, a much more diverse community of learners, people from all different parts of the socioeconomic spectrum, and they really enhance the ability of the University of Michigan as a whole to deliver on its mission. Uh, so we continue to look for ways to um, partner amongst the three campuses, either partnering on our research, partnering by sharing services that we provide to students on all three campuses, uh, sharing some of our back office resources amongst the campuses to make them all economically efficient. Um, you heard uh, in uh, um, uh, other materials recently that the Go Blue Guarantee has been extended to Flint and Dearborn. We'll make a commitment to help them do the, f help the campuses do the fundraising necessary to make that a permanent feature of Flint and Dearborn. So we'll continue to look for opportunities to make Flint and Dearborn the very best versions of a public, regional, comprehensive university they can possibly be. Uh, and I'll tell you, um, 
my many visits to both campuses, um, you can see the campus in real time changing lives. You know, people come in with a, with a set of aspirations and they leave with a trajectory. And it's really thrilling to see. So it, it's a great partnership that we want to build between the three campuses. Uh, the Board of Regents is incredibly supportive of enhancing ways to improve success at Flint and Dearborn as well. And the, we have great chancellors in place too. Hi, thank you, President Schlissel, for all those remarks. You spoke a lot about all the growth that's gonna be occurring in academic innovation and research, and specifically these groups that were formed surrounding COVID-19 and that's impact. I saw a lot of like public health and Michigan medicine um, staff and research uh, faculty there. I'm curious about what growth there's going to be in terms of the mental health and uh, just emotional well-being for students, faculty, and staff coming out of COVID and just surrounding all the collective trauma that we've gone through over the past year and a half? Yep, you know, very, very important question. So, you know, we have to continue and even quicken the rate of our investments and the breadth of the things we're trying to support um, uh, mental health and also well-being, you know, sort of preventive mental health work. Uh, what we did in the last year is we put together a group of all the different people on campus that were working on issues of wellness and mental health. We looked for ways to make them integrated and unified and come up with a coherent uh, campus-wide uh, approach that involves not just CAPS, but uh, uh, other aspects of student life, uh, our health system, our depression center, uh, various activity-based units on campus as well. And we continue to hire you know, more counselors. We try to do more group activities to increase the effectiveness of getting uh, help uh, outreach. Uh, we have um, uh, phone-based triage mechanisms to target people to the right help at the right time as quickly as we can. Uh, and we recognize that it's a problem uh, that we have to keep being purposeful to stay up with. Uh, so uh, in the first four or five years of my presidency, we kept adding more and more counselors and they kept getting more and more demand. Uh, so we have to take an approach that isn't just based on uh, having counselors available to students, but doing lots of preventive work, wellness work, stress reduction exercises, uh, things we need to hear from students about in particular, about what the sources of their stress are and work for ways globally to mitigate those things. But it, it's an incredibly important topic. Every time I have an un, unscripted meeting with a student group, uh, student mental health and wellness is on the front burner. So I, I hear you. Um, hi, so as a leader, can you reflect on ways you have been and continue to be complicit in perpetuating societal inequities and causing some of the mental health issues to students that you just discussed? Yeah, so you know, I, I really don't accept the premise of your question. You know, I think there are mental health issues and there's certainly inequities in our society. And I think one of the missions of the university is to identify the root causes of both of those things and to work to mitigate them. And you know, I've spoken about many of our efforts today on poverty solutions and mitigating childhood poverty, uh, the Go Blue Guarantee trying to promote access to a Michigan education regardless of a, a person's uh, economic basis. Um, uh, we work to promote as much diversity on our campus as we can, and we're not there yet on any of those areas. They're, they're continuous struggles. So although I certainly grant that there are tremendous inequities in society, and in many instances they're getting worse, those inequities are reflected on our own campus, and we are purposefully attempting to identify them and mitigate them. This is our final question. Hello, I'm Eve Silberman. I represent a dreaded entity called the media and <laughs> the Anna Observer. I just would like to know what you, can you tell us this time about your plans when you leave the university such as they are? Thank you. Oh, that's very kind of, um, really I had, the, the question was what are my plans when I leave the university? I, I, I'm not stepping down as president for almost two years. So this academic year and all of next academic year um, there are a myriad of things I'm excited about and interested in doing. Uh, we spoke about some of them today. Some of them we'll speak about shortly. 
Uh, I want to be uh, around to support whoever my successor is and uh, to support a um, you know, very efficient uh, uh, transition to keep the momentum of the university. Uh, so I have no specific plans. Um, I should point out I'm very proudly a tenured member of the Michigan faculty. And before I started doing academic leadership work, I was just an old biology professor. And I taught undergrads and graduate students and medical students at different institutions. I ran a research lab trying to understand the mechanisms of the immune system. Uh, and um, you know, if nothing more interesting comes along, I'm going to go back to what I, what I know how to do and love, is teaching and research. But thank you. Uh, we'll see. Uh, so um, was, was that it, or Jenny? Are we, OK, well, look, thank you all very, very much. Have a fantastic academic year. Thanks for all the hard work and support. And I look forward to working together into the future. Go Blue.